The new Prime Minister hasn't had so much of a honeymoon. It's been more like a horror show. Welcome to Birmingham and the Conservative Party Conference, where we'll be talking live to the Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Her big promise was to get the economy growing. Through tax cuts and reform. With massive spending on energy bills too. But the Chancellor told us that was just the beginning. And there's more to come. I want to see people retain more of their income. The government has lost control of the British economy. And for what? The problem? The markets don't believe their sums add up. It's making me reconsider how much I can actually afford. It's impossible for me to ever, ever get on the property ladder. The polls and the pound have taken a hammering too. Is your party behind you? So as Liz Truss arrives in Birmingham, we have one big question. With so much pushback, can she make it work? The Prime Minister is here. I'll be talking to her in the next 10 minutes. And also with me in Birmingham is the Shadow Chancellor, Labour's Rachel Reeves. And with me for the next hour is Sharon White, the chair of the John Lewis Partnership, Pippa Crerer, the Guardian's political editor, and Michael Gove, the former levelling up, education, justice, cabinet office and environment secretary. Have I missed any, Michael? Now he's on the back benches after attacking Liz Truss's plans during the leadership election. They will give their reaction to the Prime Minister's interview later. But it's not all politics. If anyone in your house loves Star Wars, you might want to tell them we'll be speaking to Luke Skywalker himself a bit later, Mark Hamill. Good morning from Birmingham and a very warm welcome to our viewers watching around the world as well as here at home. Now, Pippa Kerr, firstly to you, you and I have done a lot of these kind of party conferences, big get togethers. This is pretty unusual, isn't it, to start against this backdrop? In 20 years of covering politics and coming to these annual events, I've never been in a situation like this. I've never seen a situation like this. There's so much that Liz Truss needs to do. She needs to convince her very jittery party, both mm. members who backed her obviously during the contest and MPs, that she understands their concerns. But much more importantly, she needs to talk beyond them to the mm. public who are incredibly anxious about the prospect of mortgage rates going up, about energy bills and about the winter that we've got ahead with many parts of public services on their knees. She needs to show them that she's listening. And it really is about the economy, isn't it? I mean, Sharon White, you've got a unique blend of experience running John Lewis now, which has contacts with so many customers every single week. But you also used to have a very senior job mm. at the Treasury. How would you describe what's going on in the economy? I mean, it's unprecedented. We've had two years of COVID and now we're in the sort of the biggest cost of living crisis we've had since the 19. 70s and so I think the government's pro-growth aspiration I think it's very laudable uh, obviously with the, the the sorts of risks and turbulence we've seen this week the the, the, the worry is that mm. that laudable aim is undermined so certainly I think businesses customers worried up and down the country I think we're looking for security and we're looking for stability and what are you sensing from your customers what are people how yeah. are people behaving are they changing their behavior I think they are so I think customers um, are feeling it so we've got more customers this year in Waitrose and John Lewis but they're all buying just a little bit less so mm. You know, you're probably putting off that sofa purchase till next year. Obviously, with mortgage rates rising, that's another potential drag. So I think cost of living and action is, is incredibly important. And that's being reflected in this morning's front pages. We can just take a little look at the Observer there talking about how public support seems to have slumped for the Conservatives. The People is saying you've lost their trust, Liz Truss. But the Telegraph suggesting, Michael Gove, that Liz Truss has got no intention of turning. Now, you were very critical of her during the leadership campaign. What do you want to hear from her this morning to convince you she is on the right track? Well, this is a time of profound uncertainty and concern for people across the country. As Sharon's just reminded us, um, we're in grim economic circumstances. People mm -hmm. are facing the prospects of their, their mortgages uh, rising. Uh, people are uh, looking to Liz and to Quasi, and they want reassurance. They want to know that uh, uh, this plan has been well thought through, 
that it will work, that it will command the confidence of the money men in the markets, but also they want to know that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor share their values. And this is a critical question. It's not just about commanding economic confidence. It's about showing that in their hearts they know what people want to see in the next few years. And do you think they do from what you've seen in the last seven days? Well, I think that uh, there were a number of mistakes that were made last Friday in the uh, uh, fiscal event, the mini-budget uh, there. Uh, but there is room and time to address them and to correct them, and that's the challenge this week. And you mentioned Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor there. Um, Pippa, I just want to ask you about another story um, this morning, it's in the Sunday Times, about Kwasi Kwarteng meeting up with some bankers and hedge fund financiers on the evening of the mini-budget. Do you think that's going to cause political trouble? I think it brings uh, his judgment into question. Uh, in the Sunday Times story, uh, suggesting, being told that, that he should double down on his plans. And of course, as we all know, he then went on television on Sunday and suggested there might be more changes to come. So I think it definitely brings his judgment into question. And secondly, the big problem that the government faces right now is showing people that they're on their side, that's already been buffeted a bit on that with the 45p mm -hmm. tax cut and the bankers' bonuses um, policy. And now to make it look as though actually he's prepared to talk and maybe even act, uh, though of course the Treasury denies that there was that, that was a mm. conversation, um, on the back of a meeting, a champagne reception with uh, hedge fund managers who stood to benefit from the pound collapsing potentially, um, is, you know, it really, it really, I think a lot of people will be sitting there going at home thinking, are they on my side? Okay, well plenty to talk about with trust, no question, and probably we would expect country. And when I came into office, people were facing energy bills of up to £6,000 this winter. We were facing rampant inflation and a slowing economy. So it was vitally important that we acted. And we've acted on all of those things, uh, making sure that people aren't paying more than £2,500. A typical family isn't. Making sure we're dealing with the issue of inflation because our energy package uh, is likely to reduce inflation by up to 5%, but also taking action to get the economy growing, because that is so vital, both to help us get through this winter, which is going to be incredibly tough, but also to build a better economy in the long term, one where there are higher wages, more jobs, and more opportunities. So it's important that we acted. And if I'd come on your show, and I remember mm -hmm being on the show last month and you said to me, what are you going to do mm -hmm. about these problems the country is facing? If I'd come on your show now and we hadn't acted on those things, we would be in serious trouble as a country. Can I just say though, on energy, just to be completely clear for people, you said that you've um, controlling bills for a typical family. What has actually happened is that you've capped the unit price and many people may well end up still paying more than two and a half thousand pounds. And we should be crystal clear about that, shouldn't we? Yeah, this is, this is the bill for an average family, but what we are preventing is those extraordinary bills that people were expecting. It is a big energy package, and it's the biggest part of our mini budget. But that and it was important mm -hmm. that the government stepped in to deal with this. And we're not just and dealing it, with it, mm -hmm. as the Labour Party have suggested, for six months. We're dealing with it for two years to make sure people have that reassurance so they're and not you've, facing and you've, those and you've ultra high. Point, and you've made that point about your energy offer to the country. Mm. You've made that very clear. But something else has happened in the last seven days that's not just about what you're doing on energy bills. As we come on air today, people are worried about their mortgages. 
They're worried about their rent. They're worried about being able to pay their business loans. Do you feel any responsibility for that anxiety? So I understand how worried people are. And I understand that people are struggling and it's very, very difficult times. And this is a global problem. You know, we've got Putin's war in Ukraine, the aftermath of COVID. And what is happening around the world is that interest rates are rising. So the Federal Reserve have pushed its interest rates up to 4%. You know, this is a global but this phenomenon. is not just a global problem. Absolutely, there are issues in economies right around the world right now. But this is not just a global problem. What happened when you announced the measures in your mini budget? Billions of pounds of tax cuts with no information about how those would be paid for. Billions of pounds of extra borrowing with no clarity about how they would be paid for. What happened was that the pound slumped, interest rates shot up, and that has left people in this country with a deep sense of worry as a result of the decisions that you and your chancellor made. Do you accept that? Well, first of all, I want to reassure people that we do have a very clear plan. First of all, about how we are going to get through this winter with our energy plan. And you've made that point, but, also, but I'm asking you about also what was how we are, by the mini budget. How we are dealing the with the issue of a slowing economy. And this is important. And we'll, and we'll come because on we to also that, but, needed but to act. We all, Laura, this is why we had to act. And that's the point I want to make clear. And, and we had to that. act. <laughs> yeah, we had to act as well on taxation to make sure people weren't paying those national insurance rises going into this winter. And we also had to act on other areas of taxation but, but like to make sure the economy didn't slow down any further. And, and, and this is important because what the government is trying to avoid mm -hmm. is a serious economic slowdown that would have real difficulties for people. Now, but, but I did want to answer your question, Laura, that you asked me about you know, the, the, direct the, 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 the issues we've seen this week. So I'm afraid there is an issue that interest rates are going up around the world. And we do have to face that and we do have to do that. But I do want to say to people, I understand their worries about what has happened this week. And I do, I do stand by the package we announced. And I stand by the, by the fact that we announced it quickly because we had to act. But I do accept we should have laid the ground better. But there are, I there, do there, accept that. You accept you and should I, have laid I, the ground better. And I have learnt from that. I have learnt from that. And I will make sure that in future we do a better job of laying the ground. Laying the ground, fine. You've acknowledged what there was a problem with communications. Mm -hmm. You should have explained things better. But I want to show our audience and you what actually happened. Because this is not just a global problem. It's not arguably just a problem of communications. It's a problem of the consequence of the decision that you made. If we look at this graph, and you can look at it over there, Prime Minister, you can see what happened to the cost of government borrowing. On the mm. day that you made that announcement, mm. it spiked. And it didn't just spike. It's predicted to stay high for long. Now, the reason that matters <coughs> is when it costs the government more to borrow, Everything costs more. Everybody feels the increase in interest rates, whether that's on government, on mortgages, on people's rents. This is a direct consequence of the decisions you made last week. And interest rate increases are going to mean pressure on people's mortgages and less money for public services. We have been in a very long period of low interest rates. And the fact is that due to the war in Ukraine, perpetrated by Russia, interest rates are rising around the world. And we've seen that in the United States, and we've seen that in Europe. So but this is I don't, what I don't last accept, week. Laura. I don't accept that part of your argument. Now, on the subject of government borrowing, well, well, I think it on, is forget, right. Forget me, trust. We'll come to that. Mm. We'll come to that in a second. But look on that graph. That is a spike in the cost of borrowing for the government, which feeds through to everybody else as a direct result of the decisions that you announced on September the 23rd. This is not about what was going on in the war in Ukraine already. We, we know that that's a huge challenge. But look at the direct result on that day. And the chief economist at the Bank of England, That Hugh is Hill, not the same as interest rates, though, Laura. But it so all I, think, I think the audience should be clear that that is not the same 
as interest rates, but it all feeds which through. are rightly set but, by the independent bank of but England. But it's about the cost of government borrowing, and that feeds through to so many other things. And there are problems in other countries around the world, but the Bank of England's chief economist has said the rise in borrowing undoubtedly had a UK-specific component. Standard & Poor's, one of the biggest, one of the world's biggest credit rating agencies, put the government on notice saying that the country might have a credit downgrade. You can't just say this is something that's happening around the world. No, and I think we've made the right decision to borrow more this winter to deal with the extraordinary circumstances we face. To deal also because with the, the tax alternative, you want to give people. The alternative, Laura, let's remember what the alternative was. The alternative was people would be paying up to £6,000 on their energy bills, inflation would be 5% higher than it would be otherwise, and we would be facing a worse economic slowdown. That was the alternative. We're not living in a perfect world. We're living in a very difficult world where governments around the world are making tough decisions. And you've explained And I believe package. it was the right decision mm -hmm. to increase borrowing mm -hmm. this winter. We have the second lowest borrowing in the G7. So we currently borrow less than France. We borrow less than the United States. We borrow less than Canada. We borrow less than Japan. And I think it's important mm -hmm. people understand that. And it's now, perfectly normal now for governments of course, to borrow lots of, of money. But I, I just want and of course, we need to bring down borrowing mm -hmm. as a proportion of GDP over the medium term. And I have a plan to do that. Well, will you tell but us what that would plan be this wrong? Morning? What would be wrong, Laura, is for us not to have acted. And for families to be facing those appalling bills that w this winter, for the economy to be slowing more, and for us to be facing businesses going out of business and the UK not being competitive. But the economy took fright last week. I mean, you say this is about getting the, all about getting the economy growing. And I accept, the the short-term reaction have, was, was horror on I the financial been, markets. I've been honest, Laura, that we should have laid the ground better. But we have been dealing with a unique set of circumstances here in the United Kingdom which I think the public can appreciate. I want to reassure people that we have a clear plan moving forward, both to deal with the energy crisis and to deal with inflation, but also to get the economy growing and to put us on a good long-term footing. And what we also announced last week was plans to speed up road projects, speed up broadband projects, get Britain moving, and moving us towards the high growth, low tax economy that we need to be in order to fund our public services. And, you've, and, and that's that what's clear. important to me. And you've made that's that, what's important to me. And you've made that very clear that getting the economy growing is your, is your priority. But what many of your MPs fear is because interest rates are on the way up, because the cost of government borrowing is going up, as we've seen this morning, the fear is that the consequences will be more taxpayers' cash will be eaten up, there'll be less money for everything else. Are you going to cut public spending? I don't accept that argument and I will do what I can to win the hearts and minds uh, of my colleagues across the Conservative Party because I believe we need to grow the size of the pie. That's fundamentally what we need to do as a country and we've had two decades of relatively low growth. But how, how, what, I'm answering your question, Laura. What low growth means? Mm -hmm. Low growth means people aren't able to get the jobs they deserve. No, no, my they mean was lower wages and they mean le less money no, for public services. They mean but are so you this is why growth is so spending? important but and that is at the core of our economic policy. But are policy. you going to cut public spending? Because one of your cabinet ministers said this week, Simon Clark, he said, we look at a state which is extremely large and we have to look at how we can make sure that is in full alignment with a lower tax economy. Now, what does that mean? Well, I, I believe in getting value for money for the taxpayer. That's very important to me. And the way that we are going to improve our economy is, for example, get, helping more people get into work. That saves the government money, but it also contributes to the economy. So what we will have is a long-term plan for reform, help more people get into work, make our economy more productive, get better value for money for the taxpayer. But Prime Minister, I've asked you if you're going to cut spending on public services. Are you going to cut spending on public services? Well, what I'm going to do is make sure we get value for money for the taxpayer. But I am very, very committed to making sure we've got excellent frontline public services. And I'm not going to go into what the Chancellor will announce in his medium term fiscal plan. At the end of November. He's going to announce that very shortly. It will come together with an OBR forecast 
that's very important. But hang on. But, but my approach mm -hmm. is to help people get through this very difficult winter, and mm -hmm. it's a problem we're facing internationally. But, Karen, so this is quite a straightforward mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Are you going to cut public spending on public services? And I've asked you a couple of times, and, and normally gonna, the fact that you won't answer it directly suggests oh. that you're going to. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't, because I can't exactly set out what is going to be in this plan. What I can promise is we're going to reduce debt as a proportion of GDP. By when? But the point in the medium term, What's and we will set out term? exactly what that is when we put out the medium term fiscal plan. But the point about reducing debt as a proportion of GDP is it all depends on how fast the economy is growing. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is to get the economy growing faster so the pie is bigger and we can afford more money for great public services as well as helping keep people keep more money but in you've got pockets. an additional but challenge haven't you you've got an additional challenge because inflation means that things are getting more expensive right across the board they're getting more expensive for everybody watching this morning everybody trying to run a business also inflation means that things are getting more expensive than government departments now will you increase government spending for different departments so that they can cope with inflation at that level because if this you is don't, why they're dealing with a real terms cut aren't but they? this is why our package is so important because the energy announcement we have made is estimated to reduce inflation by up to 5%. In the short so term, this that might not happen in the long term. Some economists have questioned that. Just as it, it perhaps might in the short term, but you can't be sure of that long term. Well, we are expecting inflation to peak uh, as, the, as the sort of cost of increased energy prices flows through the system. We're expecting inflation to peak. I'm not going to write you know, future budgets mm. uh, on your show, much as you'd like me to do, Laura. <laughs> but the, the core principle I believe in is maximizing growth in the mm -hmm. economy. That's why we're pulling all the levers on everything from making our tax system mm -hmm. simpler and lower to also uh, getting projects done quicker, you know, driving reform in our economy, as well as we make our public sector more efficient. But I'm absolutely committed to delivering great public services for people. That is very, very important. But that's not the same as saying that you'll make sure departments have enough money to combat inflation. That's not the same as saying you're not going to cut public spending. Well, I believe in outcomes rather than inputs. I believe in what people see and what people feel. So, for example, the health secretary mm -hmm. has committed that people will be able to see their GP mm -hmm. within two weeks. And that's what we're focused on. We're focused on how does it feel for a patient you know, how does it feel for me as a woman walking down the street? Do I feel safe at night? Mm -hmm. These are the things I'm thinking about as Prime Minister. And that's what we're focused on, delivering better public services. And, 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 and I think quite often, frankly, the debate focuses too much on the input and not enough on how it on actually actual feels consequences for, people. for people in Britain. Well, well, and they want public services that and, are focused on... You know, the delivering good for that. services, absolutely. But let's talk then about one of those specifics and one of those r real life consequences for government decisions. Boris Johnson promised that he would raise benefit payments in line with inflation. Do you stand by that? Will you? Well, this is something the Department of Work and Pension Secretary is looking at the moment. So she will uh, make a determination on that and we will announce that this autumn. Uh, so, as Prime Minister, you won't guarantee this morning that you'll keep Boris Johnson's promise to raise benefits in line with inflation? Because the consequence of that would mean for many people who rely on benefits, most people who claim benefits are working, that they could see a cut in their income. Let's just be clear well, about will, what that would mean. This is something the Department of Work and Pension Secretary were looking at. It's worth saying, on our energy package, not only are we making sure that the average household doesn't pay bills of more than around £2,500. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We're also, for the poorest households, mm -hmm. providing an extra £1,200. So there is significant support going into the poorest but households you, this winter. But you won't make and I will always make sure, Laura, on, on inflation. I will always make sure we protect the most vulnerable in our society what about pensions? in all the decisions we make. OK, what about pensions, Prime Minister? Will pensions go up in line with inflation? I've committed to the triple lock. Okay, so that the, and the triple lock for our yes. audience who aren't familiar with yes. it, that means that pensions always rise in, in lockstep with inflation. One thing you're trying to get every single detail of the medium well, term fiscal plan it, out of me on this but show. It, but this which is an is opportunity. That's why, that's why you're here. And one of the big bold decisions that you have made as Prime Minister, which you have made a commitment on, is to scrap the top rate of tax. Now, 
there has been a lot of controversy around this policy. Some people in your party love it. Some people in your own party do not love it. Um, the opposition parties have decried it. There's been a lot of controversy around that decision. Are you absolutely committed to abolishing the 45 pence tax rate for the wealthiest people in the country? Yes. And it is part, Laura, it is part of an overall package mm -hmm. of making our tax system simpler and lower. But I think it's worth noting in the package we announced, the vast majority of that package is the energy package. And we've talked a lot about that. But it's I the to, energy I to talk package, about it's national insurance. The 45p rate actually raises very little and makes our tax system you know, more complicated. And we, we need to move away. We need to move away from the idea that everything is about how we re redistribute resources. We also need to make sure we have got a tax system that's competitive internationally and it's helping us bring in the investment, get people into work, and you, and you get people wanting to get up the career ladder. You've, you've made that, that very clear. Can I, can I ask you, Prime Minister, did you discuss scrapping the top rate with your whole cabinet? No. Do no, we didn't. It was a decision that um, the Chancellor made. Do you think that that is the right way to go about developing what has become a very controversial policy. You say it doesn't cost that much money, but it's a big decision, isn't it? If you'd well, been we, in Boris Johnson's we, cabinet and we, he had announced have, something like that without Laura, asking we you, have how would committed, you have felt? We have committed, and I committed during the leadership campaign, to make our system more competitive, to lower our taxes and to simplify our taxes. And I think that's fundamentally important. Now. When budgets are developed, they are developed in a very confidential way. You know, they're very market sensitive. Of course, the cabinet is briefed, but it is never the case uh, on budgets that they are a something that is created by the whole cabinet. The principles, though, are extremely clear. But how do you think? The perhaps, some of your about perhaps some of your cabinet might have raised what some of your other colleagues who are not in the cabinet have raised is the optics of all of this. I mean, to viewers listening this morning. You won't commit to raise benefits in line with inflation, and if you don't, that will mean a cut in income for some of the least well-off in the country. You will commit to cutting tax for the most wealthy. How do you think that looks? What I care about is about making our country successful, making our economy successful. And I do think that there has been too much focus in politics about the optics or how things look as opposed to the impact they have on our economy. Well, talking the fact is, Laura, mm -hmm. we've had two decades of relatively low growth. And decisions have been made historically quite often on the basis of we can't do this because X will be annoyed bad. or Y will be annoyed. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a failure to make decisions over time. And we've ended up with a very complicated tax system. We've ended up with our tax system and our tax burden at a 70 year high but and that has not led to economic growth so we do need to make we do need to make Laura tough decisions and I'm very clear does matter in politics doesn't it doesn't perception it do, matter it does I mean, matter did, how, how do you think some people might feel this morning when they read that quasi quarting the Chancellor was at a drinks party the day of the mini budget with hedge fund managers some of whom may have then gone on to gain from a fall in the value of the pound well, the Chancellor meets business people all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's his job. Did you know he was and going I to think go off and do that? I do not manage Kwasi Kwarteng's diary, believe me. But would you tell him not to do that again? I mean, do you think at a time when many people are struggling, as you've said this morning, you want to reassure people who are struggling and having a hard time in what might be a very hard winter, would you t say to him, do you know what, just don't do that again? Because it might give people the impression that you care more about people in the city who have a lot of money, who are going to gain from the scrapping of the top rate tax than you do from people you've mentioned, who you want to reassure, who you want to help, would it be better if he hadn't gone? I mean, I get up every morning as Prime Minister thinking, how can we make our country more successful? How can we reassure people? How can we help people get through these very difficult times? And we do face difficult times. You know, the war in Ukraine mm. is regrettably continuing. Vladimir Putin is in, is continuing mm. with his saber rattling rhetoric. You know, we, we do face very, very difficult circumstances. And that's what I'm focused on. That's what the Chancellor is focused on. And that is what the whole 
cabinet is focused now, on. Now, you've admitted this morning that there were some mistakes. You should have prepared people more carefully for your big announcements. Was one of those mistakes not publishing the forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility, which are the independent number crunchers who basically mm -hmm. check the government's sums? Was that a mistake? The issue with the Office for Budget Responsibility is I've worked with them before when yeah, I was Chief, Chief Secretary, Secretary to the Treasury. The Treasury. Yeah is it does take a while to produce those forecasts because it's an iterative process. Well, well hang on, they had, a, they had something ready to go. We know that. They had something that you could have put in the public domain that would have well, given people an idea. But the, the problem is that there is a process that you need to go through where the policies are fed in, the forecast is then, then made and it develops over time. We simply didn't have time to go through that process. So it wasn't you because were trying to of the very Absolutely not because it was a very urgent situation. And I do go back to this point that we were facing a winter where people would have been paying bills of up to £6,000, where we would have seen inflation 5% higher yeah. than it otherwise would have been, and, just briefly, and where we would have seen a more slowing now. economy. And I couldn't let that happen, and, Laura. And you've made and that I point. Completely want to work with the OBR. We had a very good meeting with them and the Chancellor this week. You know, they are going to be a full part of the medium and, term and will you publish fiscal their plan. Now? But what I couldn't do, mm -hmm. what I absolutely refuse to do, is allow people to go into this winter worrying about their fuel but bills. Just quick, that was, but that this, was but, my priority. But may I ask you a, a yes or no question? There are calls now for you to publish what you have already from the OBR, those forecasts. The opposition's calling for it, some people in your own party are calling for it. Yes or no, will you publish it before the end of November? Well, no, no, for the okay. following okay. for the following reason, Laura, yep. that it's not yet ready okay. because it, okay. it's you've got to go clear. through this process. You, and yeah, well, I know, so having made, been chief secretary, the that process clear, so you're we not go going through. to. Well, well, let's and move on. There's no I point think, in pe publishing something that's not ready. And you've made that very clear, that just Prime Minister. You've made that very clear. You've made that very clear. I think what's on a lot of people's mind this morning is how they feel they've been affected by the decisions you made in terms of increasing mortgage rates. We know hundreds of mortgage products were taken off the market. We know people are desperately worried about interest rates. And you mentioned your energy bill a lot, but we had an email from a viewer last night saying we're very grateful for the help we've had with our energy bills, but the effect of the mini budget or mortgages has meant hundreds more each month for us in mortgage payments. Your energy help may help millions of people. It may be generous. Well, it will help millions of people. But this cost people. is being wiped out for other by other costs and increases in mortgages. What is the logic of giving people money to help with their energy bills if they then lose some of it because their mortgage goes through the roof because of the consequence of the decisions you've made? Well, I understand that people are worried and people are struggling. It's a very difficult time. We have to look at the mortgage issue it, what does that mean? separately, which is the Bank of England set interest rates, not the government. You know, this has rightly been independent since 1997. And we are facing a world in which interest rates are rising. In fact, our interest rates set by the Bank of England are lower than those of the Federal Reserve just briefly, and lower than those but, other but countries. But do you acknowledge that some people are going to end up being worse off because their mortgage has gone up by more than their energy bill is being controlled by the government's freeze? Do you accept that? We want to do all we can to help homeowners. You know, we've, we've helped with stamp duty. That was one of the announcements in the mini budget. But ultimately, interest rates are a matter for the Independent Bank of England. And the Independent Bank of England do have to look at what is happening around the world. But we're asking about mortgages, not interest rates. And mortgages are not set by the Bank of England. Mortgage rates the, are a product of all sorts of factors, including decisions the government But the interest rates are a key the factor. Made. The interest rates are a key factor okay. in mortgage rates. Okay. And those are set by the Bank of England and they're somewhat dependent on the global market. So, Laura, we are not dealing with the issues we're dealing with in isolation. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with these issues in a world where there's a slowing global economy, and where there are rising interest rates, where there is huge inflation, mainly driven by energy caused by Vladimir Putin's war. And I, as Prime Minister and the Chancellor, have to deal with that in the way that we think will help people in Britain most get through these very, very difficult short-term circumstances, but put our country on the best long-term footing. And that is what the package we have put We're together running out of does. Time. We're running out of time, and you've made that point. How many people voted for your plan? 
What do you mean by that? Sorry. Well, you've set out a significant change of direction mm -hmm. from the Conservative government that you were being part of for many, many years. But how many people voted for you to do that? Well, people in 2019 who voted Conservative voted for a successful country where we are levelling up all parts of the country and where we're driving growth, enterprise and opportunity. Now, any government has to deal with the circumstances it faces. And we face this situation of, you know, which was, was unforeseen, huge energy costs, rising inflation due to the war in Ukraine and the aftermath but you, of COVID. But you know, but you know very we are well, Prime Minister, that there are a small number of people in the Conservative Party, tens of thousands rather than the whole country, voted for you in the leadership contest perfectly legitimately. But do you fear that you have put the country on a path that it didn't ask for because you believe very strongly that it will lead to growth. Finally, what happens if it doesn't work? Well, what people voted for in 2019, when they voted for con Conservative, sometimes for the first time <coughs> in many years, is they voted for a different future. They voted for investment into their towns and cities. They voted for higher wages. They voted for economic growth. And that is what our plan will deliver. I'm confident it will deliver. I'm absolutely confident that what we're doing on speeding up road projects, unleashing investment from the city, reducing taxes will deliver that. I'm not saying it's not going to be difficult. We do face a very turbulent and stormy time, but it will deliver. It will deliver on the promises we made. And in the circumstances, I'm very clear that we had to act quickly to get this plan going. Okay, Prime Minister Liz Truss, thank, thank you, you very so much. much for joining thank us you. here in Birmingham this morning. Now, just to say, thanks for sticking us during some technical glitches during that interview. Apologies for that. Now, let's get on and hear what our panel had to say. Michael Gove, what did you make of Liz Truss? Some really interesting nuggets in there. There certainly were, and I thought it was uh, right for the Prime Minister to acknowledge that um, the events of Friday, that fiscal event, need to be revisited. There need to be, uh, uh, there needs to be a recognition of mistakes, but I think that it's still the case that uh, on the basis of what the Prime Minister said, and she was very clear and authoritative, but it is still the case, I think, that there is uh, an inadequate realisation at the top of government of the scale of change required. So, yes, the energy package was the most important thing in the fiscal event, but but broadly 35% of the, uh, the m additional money that we're borrowing is not to cut energy costs, it is for unfunded tax cuts. And you sound concerned about that. I mean, profoundly. I, uh, profoundly concerned. Yes, uh, because there are two things that are problematic, two major things that were problematic with the fiscal event. The first is the sheer risk of uh, using borrowed money to fund tax cuts. That is not conservative. And then the second thing is the decision to cut the 45 pence rate and indeed at the same time to change the law which governs how bankers are paid in the mm -hmm. city of London. Um, ultimately, at a time when people are suffering, and you're quite right to point out the concerns that people have not just over mortgages but over benefits, when you have additional billions of pounds in play, to have as your principal decision the headline tax move cutting tax for the wealthiest, that is a display of the wrong values. It sounds right now, if things carry on as they are, you won't be able to vote for these measures as a Conservative well, MP. The good thing, there are many good things in what Liz said, and I do welcome the, the broader points that she made about but growth. Can you vote for it as it stands? But the critical thing is, Liz has acknowledged that uh, with hindsight, with welcome hindsight, that mistakes were made in the preparation for Friday. You're carefully avoiding my question about whether or not you'll vote for this in the House of Commons. Well, I don't believe it's right. OK, that sounds like a no, but you don't quite want to go there. Sharon White, do you feel reassured at the beginning of the programme? You sounded pretty concerned about what's going on. Has that reassured you? I think the, the, the big issue is that even mm. with the energy package, which is, which is very welcome, I think we had a really good debate on this, is that you've got people and businesses and households who are still going to be facing a real cost of living squeeze. So I think about even my own business, and we're a very unusual business as a partnership mm. because we're owned by our employees, our partners. We're stepping in as a business to provide cost of living support. So we're giving every partner £500 each to help them make free food over winter, and that's before mortgage rates start to rise. And from what the Prime Minister said, though, did you have more faith that they are putting the economy on the wrong path in the face of what clearly are very 
very serious problem. Um, so I think it comes back to what happens next. So I think for the security and the stability that people and businesses need, I think the fiscal plan and, and ensuring that the numbers add up, so mm. um, seeing how public spending balances with tax will be really important. So mm -hmm. for us, what we'll gain on corporation tax reductions, we will lose even more in terms of higher interest rates. That'll be true. If you're on £25,000, you'll, maybe you'll gain you by... A huge business or a tiny business. A huge business or tiny business, but for most ordinary people in the country on wages of 20,000 plus, they're going to lose thousands potentially on mortgage rates while gaining much less on, 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 on tax changes. Pepe, you'll have been having similar conversations to me in the last couple of days with Conservative MPs who have been really nervous, some of them very unhappy, mm -hmm. some of them still, still content with the plan, but do you think what we heard this morning is going to calm any of the jitters or maybe make it worse? I doubt it, because my big takeaway from that is that the Prime Minister is sticking to her guns. Mm. She's acknowledged that the problems with communication, but as far as she's concerned, the issues were with laying the groundwork to the announcement. It wasn't with the substance of the announcement itself. And the conversations I've had with MPs over the last few days are very much about the substance of it. One little extra bit that I thought was very striking mm. was when you asked her about the 45p mm. rate, she was very clear that it was the Chancellor's decision. Mm. And it's the first time I've heard her kind of point the finger of blame at him. And that makes you wonder, actually, is everything actually, uh, you know, how's that relationship? How's that relationship going to be going forward? Because, of course, one of the things that Tory MPs are saying is as well as making a sort of, some sort of like changes to the package itself, they are also asking whether it's feasible for Quasi Quarting to continue in his role as Chancellor. Let's talk about something else. Um, Ukraine, of course, there's a lot of coverage in this morning's newspapers about what is going on and President Putin's extraordinary claim in these fake referendums in the last few days. But there's also discussion of Ukraine's request to join NATO. Michael Gove, do you think the UK should support that bid? No. But why? <coughs> I think that uh, it would be too grave a risk for the United Kingdom and the Alliance. I believe that the support that we're giving to President Zelensky is right. I think we should do everything that we can in order to uh, support him in that conflict. Uh, but it is a significant step to extend a guarantee mm. to Ukraine, which would mean that in any future conflict, if Ukraine's borders or territorial integrity were in any way infringed, we would be committed to sending British armed forces into that conflict. I think that is a step too far. Okay, interesting to hear that. Well, we've all seen very often, haven't we, pictures of world leaders, particularly Boris Johnson, traveling to Kiev to meet President Zelensky. But one of the fascinating things about this is he's also getting huge support online and from Hollywood stars to show their support for the country. And Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars movies, has been in the news all over the world this week because President Zelensky has asked him to help. One headline reads Mark Hamill joins forces with Zelensky comparing Russia to the evil empire. Now he's supporting the Ukraine Army of Drones project and a bit earlier this morning I spoke to him to ask him exactly what that's all about. Well I think I first came on their radar when I tweeted in support of the Ukraine back in February when they were first invaded on social media on Twitter and Instagram when I did meet with him, he asked me to become an ambassador to United 24. Um, so what does this project, United 24, actually seek to achieve? Well, United 24 is the fundraising platform that you can get to if you go to u24.gov.ua. Would money that goes to that platform potentially be used for lethal weapons? You know, what's happening in Ukraine is an extremely serious and brutal conflict. Ukraine needs drones. They have some drones, but not nearly as many as the Russians. You know, I was really fascinated with this man, uh, Mr. Z President Zelensky, because uh, he's been absolutely heroic and the Ukrainian people have been uh, inspirational. He's an amazing man. Did he talk to you about Star Wars? Is he a Star Wars fan? Because he has spoken of working with you and has said, as in Star Wars, good will triumph over evil and light will yeah. overcome darkness. Yes, he did reference the movies, and uh, it's it's not hard to understand why. I mean, Star Wars was always a fairy tale for children, and fairy tales are morality tales of good versus evil where good is clearly defined, evil is clearly defined, and 
it's not hard to extrapolate an evil empire with with Russia uh, invading a sovereign nation. So uh, it's not surprising. And that's probably what uh, appealed to him about me. Would you describe President Zelensky as a fan? You say you talked about Star Wars with him, but were they films that were important to him? Apparently so. I mean, he was probably just a little boy when they first came out. Uh, we didn't dwell on it, obviously. I mean, I was surprised he had the time in his in his schedule to to even talk to me. We spoke for so long, I thought, don't you have to get back to work? <laughs> Mark Hamill, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. Thanks for having me. Mark Hamill, who has become somebody who's involved in the war effort in helping Ukraine in one way or another. Um, before we move on, Michael Gove, I just want to ask you about Liz Truss, unusually candid, perhaps, for a senior politician, um, who admitted straight out she hadn't consulted the cabinet about the 45p rate. Um, if you'd been in the cabinet and that had happened, what would you have thought? Well, it's, uh, to be fair to Liz, it is the case that budget measures are designed by the mm. Chancellor and the Treasury in concert with the Prime Minister. And it's very often the case that the most significant budget measures are not shared with Cabinet and not uh, discussed in that way. And I've sat around the Cabinet table um, uh, knowing George Osborne as a friend, mm -hmm. um, but not knowing until he stood up exactly what was going to be announced. But there's something as politically controversial that you said was about values <coughs> as well. Are you surprised? I think it's entirely legit for the, the PM and the Chancellor to make that decision. I think that there are other things that the Cabinet could understandably have uh, asked for, including more detail and more clarity from uh, the OBR and more detail on more clarity on how tax cuts would be paid for. But making a decision like that is entirely within the Prime Minister and Chancellor's remit. OK, thank you for now. Well, while the Conservatives and the country are grappling with a new reality, some people in the Labour Party can hardly believe their luck, cheered by the huge turnaround in the polls. Now, the woman who'd run the economy, if the party did make it to number 10, is Rachel Reeves. And she's here in Birmingham as well this, this morning. Good thank morning, you so Laura. much for coming in, Rachel. Um, what did you make of what Liz Truss had to say to us all this morning? I thought some of it was quite shocking, to be honest. You showed Liz Truss, you showed the Prime Minister a chart of what had happened to government borrowing costs, and then you rightly made the point that that was impacting on people's mortgages. And she said that the two things were different. Well, they are different because the borrowing costs on mortgages are even higher than what you showed in that chart. And they leaped last week um, on the government budget and then the expectations that the Bank of England will have to hike rates even further and faster because mm. of that huge injection of spending into the economy through unfunded tax cuts. Now, you take a, a family in my constituency in Leeds, mum and dad, both earning about £25,000 a year. They borrowed £200,000 for a mortgage. They're on a fixed three-year deal, but it comes up in April. They're on an interest rate of 2% at the moment. But at the moment, it looks like it's going to be at 6% when they come to renew in April. That means £8,000 extra per year in borrowing costs, more than £600 a month. People can't cope with those sorts of increases. And the Prime Minister just doesn't seem to understand the anxiety and the fear. This is a crisis that is made in Downing Street, but it is ordinary working people who are paying the price. And of course, she would dis dispute your characterisation of what she's trying to do. But isn't this trust actually... Isn't it reasonable for her to say that after many years of sluggish growth, that it is time for something radical? Well, look, the only thing that I would agree with the Chancellor and the Prime Minister on is that we need to get the economy growing. And the economy was growing by around 2.5% a year under the last Labour government, and growth has collapsed since then. And we are all paying a price for that. It means lower living standards. It means less money for public services. But this idea that trickle-down economics is somehow going to deliver the 2.5% growth that we all want to see is for the birds. And the Prime Minister and Chancellor are sort of doing some uh, uh, mad experiment with the UK economy in trickle-down economics. It's failed before and it will fail again. I set out and Keir Starmer set out at our conference last week a real plan for economic growth our green prosperity plan, investing in all parts of the country to get those good quality jobs so we can be global leaders but in the jobs do, of the but, future. But you just said you don't agree with Liz Truss on, on anything. The only thing you would agree with her in quasi Quarteng was to get the economy growing. But you do agree on some things, and you do agree, for example, in scrapping the national insurance rise that was going to go ahead. And your plans also require 
quite a lot of borrowing. So can you explain why the large amount of borrowing that you would do if you were in charge of the economy wouldn't spook the markets in the same way the government's had? Because to a lot of people think, well, Labour wants to borrow a lot of money, the Conservatives borrow a lot of money, what's the difference? So the national insurance, we always oppose that. Liz Truss and Cosy Cotting voted for that national it's insurance contribution to, get rid of it. To, to go up. We said to increase taxes on working people and the businesses that employ them in the middle of a cost of living crisis was the wrong approach. And we welcome the fact that that has been reversed. But it was the sheer scale of the borrowing in the mini budget without an Office of Budget Responsibility forecast and the gratuitous borrowing to fund tax cuts but how for would you the pay for wealthiest. It? But how would you pay for it, though, if you agree so, it's the wrong thing to go ahead with that tax rise? How would you pay for it? And how would you pay for it critically? How would you pay for social care, which that tax was designed to fund, if you're not going ahead with it? Well, let me ask, answer the second part and then the first part. So Kwasi Kwarteng, when he delivered that mini-budget, said that um, although that they were reducing national insurance back to where it was previously, it wouldn't affect the budget for the health and social care. That's really important because we know that that money is needed. And he said it would not affect but the how budget would you pay for, for, it, Rachel for that. Reeves? You've, you've made a lot of points about so, the Conservatives. Well, what I'm how saying is they are not, they're not reducing the money uh, for health and social care. So there's not a black hole there to be filled. But let me take your wider point mm. um, about Labour uh, borrowing. I, I set out a set of fiscal rules and I've said that everything in our manifesto would be fully costed and fully funded, that we would get debt down as a share of uh, GDP. Now, we are at the moment in the middle of a cost of living crisis and I think everybody understands that to get us through that, as we did during COVID, some limited borrowing is needed to address the cost of living crisis. And that's why we've been saying for ages that there needed to be um, a package to help people with their uh, energy bills. Well, let's talk that's about not that. what spooked the well, markets. Well, well, let's, what spooked the markets is the scale you've, of the package. But you've, made, you've made your points about the Conservatives' decisions, but let's talk about your plans and, and, and something that actually we asked your, your boss, the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, about last week in Liverpool. And now Labour at the moment is only guaranteeing to freeze people's energy bills for six months, not the two years that the government is is going ahead with. Well, we set out a, a fully costed and funded plan mm -hmm. well before the government had any plan in place. Now, yeah, we what, welcome the fact... But what happens fact, after six months? No, no, so we, that's not my question. What happens to people after six months? Well, we welcome the fact that the government have come forward with their, their own package and we support that support for the two-year period. The difference between us and the Conservatives is that we would fund part of that package by an extension of the windfall tax on the big profits that North Sea oil and but gas companies make. that's about how making. you would pay for it, yes, not um, for so how long people would actually actually get the help so that support, they need. Yes, so, so what Lord, happens to people after six months? Because yeah. at the no, moment, the big difference for the public on this yeah. is they can hear, well, the government's saying, we'll help you with no, your energy Lord, bills I'm for saying two that years. We support a package and for two years. So you, so so you do now support a package so for two years? We, we support that package. The only difference is, is how you would pay for it. So because you, to be because completely clear. I, I just said, we support that package. We welcome the fact that the government have finally come to the table with a package of measures. But the big difference is, how do you fund it? Yeah, and the government are putting it? it all on borrowing. We've said there should be an extension of the windfall tax on the big profits that oil and gas companies um, are making, energy generators are making. And the government are leaving tens of billions of pounds on the table that could be taxed to pay for this. But how and that Rachel means, Reed? sorry, and Laura, that means every pound that is left on the table mm -hmm. that the government has to borrow more and that is the problem with their package of measures it is all funded by borrowing but you said clearly this morning now that Labour has changed since the last seven days you say now you would commit to support well, we people's energy bills two for two years, years Laura. and you say you would pay that with a windfall tax I know that you're an economist by training you know numbers inside out but help me with this number because the two-year cost of supporting people's energy bills might come out at around 100, 120 billion pounds. These, I think it might be six, if it's six months for a 60 billion, 120 maybe for a billion. The windfall tax, I think, is projected only to raise eight billion. Now, That's, eight billion yeah. versus 120 billion, how are you going to come up with the rest of it? So we're saying an extension of the windfall, an extension of the well, windfall tax. An extension tax. of eight is so, to double it. That's so sixteen. You've still got one hundred and twenty. Yeah. So we over think there. that we can raise. And look, we haven't got any numbers from the government in any forecast. We think we can raise tens of billions of pounds through an extension of the windfall tax, backdating it to January uh, of this year when those profits started to go through the roof, to extend it to all uh, energy uh, generators beyond just uh, oil and gas, uh, and to extend it for a longer period of time. It could 
could raise tens of billions of pounds that then wouldn't have to be funded so through government so borrowing. At the moment, the government are putting all the costs for this energy package on current and future taxpayers who are going to have to pay for this eventually. And at the same time, they leave these windfall profits there untaxed. Okay, Richard, that is not right. Okay, I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Come back another time and see us. Thank you for coming to Birmingham this morning. Now, as we come towards the end of the 60 Minutes, let me remind you of our main question this morning. In the face of so much pressure and pushback in the last couple of weeks, can Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister, make her plan work? This is what she told us earlier. I do stand by the package we announced, and I stand by the, by the fact that we announced it quickly because we had to act, but I do accept we should have laid the ground better. But there are, I there, do there, accept that. You accept you and should I, have laid I, the ground better. And I have better. learnt from that. I have learnt from that. And I will make sure that in future we do a better job of laying the ground. Sharon White, the boss of John Lewis, do you close this 60 minutes feeling better or worse about the prospects for the country for the next couple of months? Um, I think it's. I think everybody's rightly anxious. I think thinking not least as a retailer and, and lots of families are going mm. to be thinking about Christmas and um, how we have a really affordable Christmas, our, I think our responsibility as a business, other businesses up and down the country, is how do we make sure that people can have a great end to the year that's affordable, more value for money. We're looking at how we freeze some of our prices so that right. families who are struggling can still have great times with their families. But I think all of us have got to step into this cost of living crisis and do all we can. Michael Grove, do you think Liz Truss will be able to get her plans past the Conservative Party and will she be Prime Minister this time next year? Oh, I'm sure Liz will be Prime Minister this time next year. But I think, um, as Liz indicated there, um, uh, there needs to be a course correction. Um, and I think that... Uh, she's not willing to do that? She's been clear she's not going to this well, morning. I, I think that um, uh, reality bites. And uh, I think that one of the things that uh, Liz indicated uh, as well is that uh, the additional work that government uh, requires to do uh, in order to show how this package is going to be paid, uh, this so-called uh, medium-term fiscal plan or strategy, that will have to be brought forward. Um, and I think that when Liz said that the ground wasn't perhaps properly prepared, mm -hmm. I hope what she meant was that um, that additional detail, which will help give confidence to the markets, but more importantly, give reassurance to the public, that needs to be accelerated. And I would hope that we would see that much sooner rather than later. And very briefly, you've been quite critical this morning. Are you trying to be helpful? Yes. Pippa, last word to you. How much trouble do you think the government faces in the next few days here in Birmingham? I think a huge amount this week, but if you think this week's difficult, wait till she's back in Parliament next week, and I think it'll be even harder then. OK, well, it sounds like from Michael Gove and others, there's going to be plenty of trouble waiting for Liz Truss back at the ranch, unless she's willing to change her mind. Thank you so much, all three of you, for being with us here this morning. And to all of you, of course, for watching. Liz Truss's start in government has been like no other that I can remember. In a few short weeks, her plans for the economy have been battered by the markets and her reputation hammered at the polls. But listening to her this morning, she might have admitted her plan could have been explained better, but it's clear she doesn't fancy changing direction. Michael Gove, meanwhile, wouldn't even confirm he'll vote for those plans in the House of Commons. So trouble in the party and perhaps more trouble in the markets too. Even as Truss's heroine, Margaret Thatcher, once warned that if you try to buck the markets, you might find that the market bucks you. There's opportunity and danger for Liz Truss here in Birmingham in the next few days. If you want to catch up with anything you missed this morning or watch again, who knows, on the iPlayer later, you can go there. Who knows where we'll all be by the time we meet again next Sunday. Until then, goodbye.